share the screen. Okay, great. Thank you, Donna, that you're happy for me to record. Um, uh, Donny, if you'd like to um, now hopefully get the screen back up again, we can make a start. While you're doing that, I'll um, introduce you, if I may. So um, welcome, everybody, to um, this final um, revisiting lecture. It's um, in the uh, Swansea University Public Lecture Series, um, Rethinking Tourism, Hospitality and Leisure in a post-pandemic world. And it's brought to you by Swansea University and our research group, which is the Center for Visitor Economy Research. And today we are delighted to be able to bring you uh, Professor Donna Chambers, who's going to be talking about envisioning post-pandemic tourism through the lens of gender intersectionality. And if I may, Donna, I'd just like to introduce you um, to say um, we're very, very pleased that you've been able to accept our um, invitation to speak to us today. Um, many of us will know you um, from your um, extensive work in the tourism field. I personally, I think I first came across your name on your visual tourism textbook with Tiana yeah. Ratchik. <laughs> And, um, but um, you're so much more than that in everything that you do. Uh, you've published um, in cultural and heritage tourism, uh, national identities, post-colonial and uh, decolonial epistemologies. And of course, um, your uh, major work in gender and uh, ethnicity. And so we're really delighted to um, have you um, talk to us today. Um, you are currently professor and head of department in uh, Sunderland uh, University and uh, you've also worked at University of Surrey and Edinburgh and Napier University so um, prestigious universities and before that I understand you spent five years uh, working in the Ministry uh, of Tourism in Jamaica um, so you've seen uh, uh, um, things from both sides of the fence um, and we are very very pleased indeed that you're able to speak to us today um, we normally try to keep this to about an hour, as you know. Mm -hmm. So um, with, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you. Oh, thank you so much um, for that introduction, Brian. Um, I just have to say that I'm actually head of research and not head of department. Um, so slightly, slightly different role, but um, thank you so much for um, actually allowing me, I should say, to participate in this fantastic public lecture series um, that you're hosting as part of your Center for Visitor Economy Research. And I know that these series of lectures are actually leading into this new master's program that you're developing in international tourism management. And I think that, you know, it, it's great that you are starting a new tourism program. And I really want to wish you every success with this program. Now, you said this is a final presentation and there are pros and cons of being the final person um, to present. Um, so I, I've actually had a bit of a sneaky peek at some of the other presentations um, because you know they're on YouTube for us all to see. Um, so I've had a sneaky look and I have to say that I've been very impressed with the range and you know the broad depth and range of, of, of presenters and, and presentations and topics um, that there have been. And I think that just to me goes to show how amazing, um, you know, this field that we're in, tourism, hospitality and leisure, it really is so broad and it is so interesting. And I think that it is still relevant today as it ever was all those years ago when I started engaging with tourism. Um, I can't say how many years ago that was. I'm just dating myself right now, but uh, it's been a long time. Um, so I think that this series of public lectures that you're having are so appropriate, particularly now um, with what is happening. And we have seen all of these the severe disruptions um, to these sectors. The coronavirus has been the main thing and the many challenges that this um, particular pandemic has brought to the surface. I think that there have been these challenges have been simmering. Um, but I think the pandemic has certainly brought a, a lot of them um, to the surface. Now, I would say that the challenges that we have faced um, as a result of the pandemic has been particularly acute for um, Black, Indigenous and people of color. 
and particularly for women within these communities. And this is whether they live um, in the countries of what we're calling the global north or the countries of the global south. Now, I think in order to provide a kind of backdrop for the discussion that I'm going to have today, um, I just want to show you um, a few slides around what is happening in terms of the pandemic for these communities, not just in general, but also in terms of our, our industries, tourism and hospitality and so on. So I was looking through some, um, you know, we have become obsessed with the news. I've certainly become more obsessed with the news than I've ever been. And I'm reading all sorts of, you know, newspaper reports, um, just reports in general, not necessarily all academic but around the pandemic. And one of the things, um, these are just some examples of some news reports. Um, here in the UK, um, we have seen that black people are twice as likely to catch the coronavirus as any other um, ethnic or racial group. Another report, and this is from the New Yorker, actually described the pandemic as the black plague because of the impact that it was having on the black and um, you know black black and indigenous and people of color, all of the people from those communities. So you know that is just an indication, very strong language there, but that is just an indication of the impact that it has had on these communities. Then when we look at women. Um, there are other reports that have shown that Black women are four times likelier to die of COVID. Then in terms of the industries that we're talking about or the sectors that we're talking about, there is another report that showed the lack of Black leadership in the hotel industry. This is another thing from the New York Times, how high-end restaurants have failed Black female chefs, right, talking about you know, the role that the female chefs have not, the roles that they have not been able to acquire within the restaurant industry. Then another report um, from another, this is more of an industry um, publication where it's time for the hospitality industry to really listen um, to black women. Then when we look at the job market, we notice that the COVID-19, this is another newspaper report saying that the COVID-19 job market wreaks havoc on Black women, right, because it's been particularly acute for Black women. And then there's another report that says that Black and Hispanic women aren't sharing in the job market recovery, because apparently the job market has started to recover slightly since the big downturn in 2020. And it is showing here that Black and Hispanic women aren't really sharing in the job market recovery that is happening. Um, since the, 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 as a result of the pandemic. Now, what we have seen happening, and these are mostly reports from countries of the global north um, where there are minority populations. But even if we look at what is happening in countries in the global south, in poor countries, in developing countries, we can see that the pandemic is wreaking havoc, not just on the people, but on the economies of those countries. And we have been looking at the whole issue with the vaccine rollout as well, that has scarcely touch the countries of the global south. I mean, here in countries like the UK, in the States and other developed countries, um, there's even talk about getting booster shots, right? People who have already had two vaccines are now looking to, you know, they're now looking to give them booster shots when many countries in the developing world haven't even been able to vaccinate um, not even most of their populations. So I was listening and I talked to a news report that said that only just over 1 million people in Nigeria had actually had two doses of the of vaccines and there are over 200 million people actually in Nigeria. So it just goes to show you that sort of inequity um, that exists in the world, even with regard to the pandemic. Now, when we look at the pandemic, we know that the tourism, hospitality and leisure industries or sectors have been some of the worst affected. And it is of course important that we know that we are engaging in these critical debates about who and what tourism, leisure and hospitality are for. And as we transition into a post-pandemic world, these questions become even more pertinent. Now, as we engage in these debates, what I would argue is that the issue of gender equality, particularly through the lens of intersectionality, must be at the very heart of these discussions. And this is why I have been showing you these, you know, this kind of backdrop as to how serious the pandemic has been um, for people of color and particularly women of color um, as well. So I would like to start though with what I believe to be an incontrovertible statement. And I don't think anybody would disagree with this, that gender matters in tourism. 
I'm saying in tourism because this is the field that we're dealing with, but certainly gender matters in every aspect of our social world, right? But gender does matter in tourism. And if we look at some of the figures that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, um, and these are figures from the United Nations that women um, constitute, the UNWTO, I should say, that women constitute 54% of the tourism workforce. And this is compared to 39% um, in the wider economy. So we can see there's a high representation of women in the tourism workforce, and yet gender inequalities dominate in the sector. Now, I can go through a long list of the gender inequality that exists in this sector, but we can, I'm just going to name a few of them now. Women are underrepresented in the lowest paid and the most insecure jobs, and they're often in the informal sector. There's a gender pay gap in tourism, like in almost every other sector in our economy. It's around 14% in tourism. And although this is a little bit lower than the gender pay gap in the, the economy in general, which stands at about 16%, 14% is nothing to shout about, right? There's still a gender pay gap. And women in tourism are actually underrepresented in key managerial positions. So when we look at the global, and I've put success here in inverted commas, right? Because again, we ask success for who? right? So the global success of the tourism and hospitality sectors has been built on unequal gender relationships. Yet kind of paradoxically, tourism can and does sometimes lead to the empowerment of women, especially in small communities. So the question that we need to ask is whether this empowerment has led to fundamental change in gender relationships in society more broadly. Now, in fact, the UN published a policy brief last year um, in around April, April, which focused on the impact of COVID-19 on women. And this report concluded that women were the hardest hit by the pandemic. Now, this is women in general. Now, this result is unsurprising because in the context of tourism and hospitality, which are the sectors that we, we have um, understood have been the most negatively impacted by the pandemic, as mentioned before, women are overrepresented, so suffering huge losses to their jobs and their livelihoods. In addition, while more men than women have and continue to die from the virus, significant resources that have been invested in fighting the virus have actually been diverted from many of the services that impact on women, such as sexual and reproductive health and domestic abuse services. Now, women have also, been in, have also been bearing an increasing share of responsibility for children during the pandemic when many women were homeschooling um, their children. And they have, also been, they have also borne an increasing share of responsibility for elderly relatives as well um, during this pandemic. So with all of this backdrop in mind, the situation does appear to be very gloomy for women and it represents a setback for the achievement of several of the UN's sustainable development goals, including goal number five, which focuses on gender equality and the empowerment of women. Now, there was a further UN policy brief that was published last August, and that was titled COVID-19 and Transforming Tourism, and that listed five priorities for this transformation, one of which involves the management of the crisis, and particularly mitigating its adverse effects, particularly on women's employment and economic security. So that while the impact of the pandemic on women in tourism has been devastating, as I mentioned before, the situation for black women in countries in the global south and for black women who represent minority and often migrant communities in the global north is particularly dire. Now for these women, not only do they suffer from sexism, but also from racism. And therefore the question of gender intersectionality is key to thinking about how societies can recover from the pandemic. Now I would like to focus particularly on this intersection between gender and race. Now thinking about my own subject position as somebody who comes originally from the Caribbean, which is considered to be in the global south, and I've now been residing in the United Kingdom for over two decades. Um, and the United Kingdom is obviously, was obviously once the center of a vast colonial and imperial empire. 
I am talking from this positionality as this woman who is within what we would say call the seat of the previous empire. And it is this positioning that has influenced my decision to seek to unpack the complexity of what is this socially constructed and power political concept of gender, which drawing from Western Zimmerman produces, reproduces and legitimates choices. So what I want to do is to problematize gender through an, explor an exploration of the often ignored or bracketed intersection between gender and race. So race is like gender, a social construct, which wields great political power. And like Anne McClintock, I agree that gender and race are not isolated from each other. I do not, ex I do not experience gender and race as a distinct and separate part of my own lived experiences. And I would suggest in similar vein to Anne McClintock, that gender and race are articulated together and have been integral to sustaining power relationships in tourism, particularly between the Western world and the countries of the global South. Now, gender intersectionality has not often been studied in tourism or seen as integral to tourism policies and practices, although there is increasing recognition that this is a necessary and valid way of exploring issues of power and, or, and, and disadvantage. But what I want to suggest here is a more nuanced approach to tourism gender research and practice, which focuses on this gender race intersection while being cognizant of the fact that gender has many different intersections with a host of other social categorizations, such as sexuality, class, nationality, and disability, among other things. I have to say, um, and, and you know, this is, this is quite problematic for me, is that I've become a little bit exhausted, right, with discussions, primarily by white tourism scholars, about black women's oppression and our empowerment through tourism. I have to say that I've also become exhausted with um, what Henry wrote a, a, a little discussion piece about volunteer tourism and said that he, um, you know, there was this unspeakable whiteness of volunteer tourism and the seemingly endless march of white saviors across the countries of the global South. So I've become exhausted also with sitting through endless con conference presentations where predominantly white tourism scholars present anthropological and or sociological accounts of their research in indigenous communities in the global South with a lack of reflexivity on their own motivations for embarking on such research and effects of their research on these communities. And this is something that Linda Tuhuai Smith spoke about several decades ago in her book on decolonizing methodologies. So I'm concerned about intersection between gender and race. And I want to take a slightly different perspective by focusing on white female privilege rather than the traditional black female disadvantage. I've spoken about the black female disadvantage in the COVID statistics and in tourism and so on, but I just want to shift the lens a little bit now um, to look at the other side and look at white female privilege. Now, I think it is possible to do this through the prisms of black feminist theory and critical race theory, and specifically with regard to critical race theory, the study of whiteness, which was developed in academia from the works of noted African-American scholar and civil rights activist, W.E.B. Du Bois. Now I suggest in this presentation that the study of whiteness is one way in which gendered power relationships in tourism can be understood. And through this understanding, we can start to think about how we might foster the sustainable development of tourism after the pandemic. Now my contention is that the concept of whiteness is relevant to our contemporary understanding of the location of power and privilege in tourism when discussing the intersection between race and gender. Now, I contend that in tourism, there has been little, if any, problematization of the way in which whiteness shapes ways of knowing, which we are talking about here in terms of epistemology and ways of being, or in other words, ontology. Whiteness provides a lens through which we can explore exploitation and subjugation in tourism. So my suggestion here is that in tourism, 
we have concentrated almost exclusively on racial disadvantage. And consequently, we have failed to adequately theorize the power that comes from racial privilege. Furthermore, we have failed to explore in tourism how whiteness can be understood through the lens of intersectionality in order to unpack white women's privilege. In fact, there seems to be a discursive silence around the notion of white women's privilege in tourism. Now, I previously mentioned W.E.B. Du Bois and who is said to have initiated the study of whiteness. Now, Du Bois suggested that at the heart of white identity is a passionate belief in one's right to everything and anything, or as it were, the title to the universe. It is this sense of entitlement that underpinned colonial expansion and exploitation of non-white peoples politically, socially, economically, sexually, and I would add also in terms of research and knowledge. Now, since the boys unpacking of whiteness, there have been several understandings and applications of the concept. Now, one of the, one of the, the more interesting and seminal ones is Ruth Frankenberg's text on the social construction of whiteness, in which she problematizes the role of white women in the feminist movement. And she used the term whiteness to describe a set of three intellect dimensions, which includes whiteness as a location of structural advantage and as a set of cultural practices that are usually unmarked and unnamed. Frankenberg adds a self-reflexive element by arguing that whiteness is also a standpoint or place from which white people look at themselves, others, and society. She suggested further that whiteness is not an empty signifier, but is instead, and this is quoting from her, a daily experience of racial structuring. Now, Richard Dyer also um, had a, a very interesting book called The Matter of Whiteness, and he argued that it has become common for those marginalized by culture to acknowledge the situation from which they speak. But those who occupy positions of cultural hegemony blatantly carry on as if what they say is neutral and unsituated, human, not raced. Dyer also added that in the realm of categories, black is always marked as a color, as the term colored egregiously acknowledges, and is always polarizing. Whereas white is not anything really, not an identity, not a particularizing quality, because it is everything. White is no color, because it is all colors. Now I suggest that in contemporary quotidian tourism practices and theorizations of power, whiteness has become normalized and is rendered invisible. Now going back to that um, discussion from Henry who was speaking about volunteer tourism that I mentioned before, in discussing volunteer tourism, he suggested that the limited data on the race of volunteers suggests a majority of international volunteers are white because whiteness is invisible, so why mention it? Indeed, whenever we speak about race in tourism, it is always seen as applicable only to those who are not white. White people are in this sense not racialized and therefore remain unresearched. In other words, there is in tourism largely silence around the power of whiteness as a racialized categorization. Now, drawing from Dyer again, in our time, it is only extreme right and racist discourse that has an acknowledged and clear concept of a white race. So to talk about race is to talk about all races except the white. Now, the invisibility of whiteness has meant that in tourism, we have not yet sufficiently theorized the location of power. Whiteness, like other racial categorizations, is of course constructed. And according to Lipsitz, is a scientific and cultural fiction that has no valid foundation in biology or anthropology. In fact, whiteness, as well as other racial identities, has no essence. And according to Nakayan and Prajek, they are only historically contingent constructions of their social locations. However, while recognizing the fabricated nature of all racial categorizations, this is not to deny that they do nonetheless have a material reality and real social consequences for the way in which wealth, 
prestige and opportunity is distributed in our societies and in tourism. Indeed, Lipsitch stated that race is a cultural construct, but one with sinister structural causes and consequences. Now, joined from Krista Ratcliffe, um, who indicated that while gender classifications have a long history, tropes of race, including, of course, whiteness, have a much shorter but more complex history. The racial category white has come to occupy a position of privilege and advantage, even if all white people do not share identical social and economic privileges. Radcliffe states further that like gender, race is always a question, not only of difference, but of unearned privilege and power and the lack thereof. So hegemonic whiteness is often portrayed almost exclusively as heteropatriarchal and, has, and as such has paid insufficient attention to women. In tourism research in particular, there is a dearth of studies which investigate the racial meanings attached to being a white woman, such as in the context of tourism to the post-colonial countries of the global south, to countries in Africa, in the Caribbean, and in Latin America, for example. Now, this is despite the existence of several studies, which, for example, examine Western female solar travelers as subjects and others which have investigated the way in which Western women are objectified and sexualized by the black male gaze through the tourism experience. Now, the issue of race does emerge in a very few of these studies, but it is not conceptualized in terms of studies of whiteness. One question that we need to ask is how do white women perform gender in liminal post-colonial tourism spaces? Von Rehr, Von Rehr has suggested that in feminism, the representation of white women has been in terms of gender, class, and sexuality while eliding the dynamics of race. Rehr indicates that a potent symbol of colonial repression was the threat of real or imagined violence toward white women, which became one of the most dangerous forms of insubordination. A colony was secure to the extent that it was able to keep its white women protected from the fear of sexual assault. Indeed, Ware argues that white women provided a symbol of the most, of the most valuable property known to white man, and it was to be protected from the ever encroaching and disrespectful black man at all costs. More broadly, Ruth Frankenberg suggests that race shapes the lives of white women in similar fashion to the way men's lives are shaped by gender and sexuality shapes the lives of heterosexuals. In our contemporary world, the financial, emotional, sexual, and legal advances occasioned by feminism for largely white Western women has meant that they are now capable of performing whiteness, a status which has provided them with resources, power and opportunity, even if only in the context of the liminal spaces of post-colonial tourism, which are necessarily fleeting. Now, I think it is, it is possible to unpack white female privilege in tourism, in the tourism context through one example, Right? And this example is through a critical analysis of female sex tourism. In this activity, primarily middle-aged white women from Western countries travel to countries in the global South in order to engage in sexual relations with normally young black men, often perhaps derogatively termed as beach boys, rent harassers, or cowboys. In one of the first tourism articles on the subject of female sex tourism, Proit and Lafont suggest that these women are able to explore more dominant roles in the tourism relationship due to their economic and social status, which invests them with an independence that translates into power and control over these men. In their study, however, Proit and Lafont failed to articulate a theory of race, which might provide a useful explanatory framework for the source of the women's economic and social power especially in the context of these post-colonial tourist destinations. I suggest that such power and control is fundamentally underpinned by conceptualizations of whiteness. Now, Mezaros and Bazzaro Bazzaroni actually um, spoke about this issue 
And to quote from them, they mention that Black men's historically dangerous hypersexuality has now become a valuable commercial commodity in the context of this um, female sex tourism. So white women's desire for sexual intimacy with Black men, a formerly taboo and transgressive relationship during the colonial era, can now be viewed as a creative force behind the consumption of black male bodies as actual commodities. Now, Franz Fanon in The Wretched of the Earth speaks to the colonial situation by noting that in the colonies, the economic superstructure is also a substructure. The cause is the consequence. You are rich because you are white and you are white because you are rich. Now, as Jacqueline Sanchez Taylor has suggested, focusing on gendered power can easily slip into accepting gender essentialist models of sexuality within which the sexual behavior of women is interpreted and judged differently from that of men simply because they are women. Such an approach tends to privilege the power of gender, occluding the power of race. And following on from Fanon's statement, also the associated characteristic of economic power which is rather loosely encompassed by class, and especially of whiteness, which I suggest is fundamental to female sex tourism to the countries of the post-colonial world. Through the example of female sex tourism to the post-colonial world, the traditional gendered power relations between men and women is reversed through the intervening factor of race. The women racialized as white have privilege and power, while the men racialized as black do not. While it might be that the situation is not so clear cut and binary, that is, white women can sometimes be vulnerable and exploited by foreign exotic others, and black men are not always dependent and passive objects of women's desires. An intersectional approach allows, according to Felix Thompson, allows for the fluidity of power, acknowledging that not all oppressions function oppressively in all situations at all times. I would contend that in the context of white female sex tourism to countries of the global south, historical power political colonial relationships, which are both sexualized and racialized, still have a very potent force in the dynamics that play out between white women and black men in the sexual encounters inherent in tourism as a spatial and temporal phenomenon. Yet when race is spoken about in tourism, it is often focused on race disadvantage and not on race privilege. This is further problematized when one adds a gendered dimension. Through sex tourism, as an example, white power is reproduced and reinscribed in the Caribbean and other parts of the global south, not only by Western men, but also by Western women. What I am suggesting is that we need to examine the sources of power in tourism if we are to consider how tourism might recover after the pandemic. My argument is that the sources of power are inextricably intertwined with racist notions of white privilege, which are exercised by both men and women. An intersectional approach which recognizes the interplay between gender and race and which acknowledges the potency of whiteness enables a more critical unpacking of the power inherent in tourism, particularly though not exclusively in liminal post-colonial tourism spaces. I would like to say though, that my discussion of whiteness is not intended because I can see you know, the arguments that are coming forth there, I can anticipate them, that my discussion of whiteness is not intended to create a simplistic dichotomy between black and white. It is not intended to homogenize whiteness, but rather like Gayatri Spivak, what I am calling for is a problematization of positionality. As someone from the global south, as a woman, as someone who is black, who has been racialized as black, I have become accustomed to tourism narratives that focus on the racialized other, largely espoused by white Western scholars. I am encouraging white people to reconsider myopic understandings of racial power within tourism by refracting their epistemological lens onto themselves. 
Using the lens of whiteness theory, white people, including white women, are implored to reflect on their own racial identities, the privileges that accompany them, and how this serves to legitimate racial inequalities in tourism. I agree with Richard Dyer that the point of looking at whiteness is to dislodge it from its centrality and authority, not to reinstate it, and much less to make a show of reinstating it when like male power, it doesn't actually need reinstating. So going back to the central question that has stimulated this series of public lectures, who or what is tourism for? I would suggest that important to addressing this question is problematizing the power of whiteness and its gender dimension, which would allow for an excavation of a central source of exploitation that persists in all forms of tourism, including in research. In considering the mainstreaming of gender, because this is where, you know, when you look at all UN reports and so on, there is this notion of gender mainstreaming, right? And I'm saying that in considering this gender mainstreaming, in considering how we might, to quote, leave no one behind, in all our tourism policies, practices, and operations, we need to take an intersectional approach, recognizing the differentials in power relationships that exist in this category of woman. And while I have focused here on the intersection between gender and race, there is also space to consider other intersections associated with, for example, trans women, disabled women, and I could go on. I argue that such an exercise is a necessary endeavor for the sustainable and ethical development of tourism after the pandemic. So it's time for us to really look at these issues and to rethink tourism within this concept, context. So yeah, thank you. And I am open to questions. So I hope I was within time there. Very much word, Donna. That's fantastic. Um, I really uh, enjoyed that talk. Very great deal of food for thought there and um, very clear and powerful message. Um, so I'd like to open up the floor. If anybody would like to ask a question, please um, uh, feel free. Um, just uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, Stromo, I see, I see your hand. Would you like to ask a question? Or was that just a, a clap? It was a clap. It was a clap. Ah, okay, I, so I can't well. tell a clap from a hand up. <laughs> anybody, anybody would like to start things going? So I'll, I'll start off then and uh, Donna, I'm really interested to see that you're you're prob problematizing this not just as um, something out there in tourism, but something that is absolutely central for us as researchers. Um, what would you say would be the, the 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 one thing that we should start with in order to um, uh, try to un and untangle white privilege in, in, in tourism research? So well, I'm very much into um, reflexivity. Yeah. And I think that one of the first things that we need to do is to think about our own positionality. What are our motivations? Why are we doing this? What is it? What are the ends? You know, why are we doing this research? Who is the research for? Who will benefit from this research? And I think that this is something that we really need to think about. Um, I mean, I am reflecting on this and I think everybody needs to reflect on this. And I have to say, I think, as I said in my presentation, I've been to over the years, so many um, conferences and, and so many presentations. And it always amazes me, um, not amazes me, but I always reflect on why are people doing research in these places? Why are you going there? You know, what is it that drives you um, to some of these places? And I'm not saying that people can't do research in societies that are different from their own, um, but I think it's a lack of reflexivity 
and the lack of thinking or even expressing um, any of these issues that has troubled me, I think, over the years. And, you know, it's the whole thing about remaining silent in the text, right? Who are you? Mm. Why, why did you do this? And it seems to me that it's always um, people from the West that are going to research in developing countries. If you're, if you're researching um, as somebody from a developing country in tourism, it's not as frequent as people from the West actually doing research in developing countries. So I've always been wondering, what is, why is this happening? Um, is this about power and privilege? Is this about you having the ability, the capacity, the, the power to go to these places that certainly not everybody in, in, in tourism has this, this particular power and this particular privilege to do that? So it's about reflexivity, I think, is, is, is the first thing and thinking about motivations and, you know, what is the research for and who is it for? Thank you. Um, would you, just to follow that up and maybe to be controversial, um, there was talk on Trinet, I remember not so long ago, about whether um, our work should have a re uh, kind of a, a statement. Um, all, all we should all um, add this to our research papers as kind of a statement of positionality. Do you think that would assist in matters? Um, well, I am a qualitative researcher, right? And I think that you should always have your voice in the research because the research isn't neutral, right? It's not neutral whether you're qualitative or quantitative, right? It tends to be qualitative researchers that may say something about their positionality, and it's not all that do that. But this notion of research being neutral, I think is, is for the, maybe use a quote that I got from here for the birds, right? <laughs> research is not neutral. Right. Even the, 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 the topic that you think about researching, the way that you go about it, the interpretations that you have, all of it comes from some position. Right. And you need to think about your positionality. And I think that there is a way to do that within research. I mean, just stating that, oh, I am so and so and I am this and that and just sticking that in the paper to me is not enough. Right. Mm -hmm. That isn't is about how you do it and it needs to flow through everything that you're doing. So I do see papers where people are saying, let's just stick that in. So what? So you're mm -hmm. stuck that in. How does it influence your interpretations? How has it run through the whole research process? So I'm not just ab I'm not about just sticking something into a paper. Right. It's about showing how that actually has a bearing on the situation or on the particular research that you're doing. Yes, I 100% I agree. I, when, when that discussion on Trinet was happening, I was thinking this is, is not the solution to the problem. The research itself should be um, strongly, um, clearly, your, your position in it should be, should be very clear. And it, um, add, adding a tag on the end is probably not going to, uh, to change very much. Um, so thank you for those reflections. Has anybody else got any questions on the on the talk? I'm sure can we I, must do. Can I, can I ma make a comment? Um, Sandra, so, yes, please do. Yeah. Oh, Donna, I always love it to hear you. You're just brilliant. Thanks, Sandra. Um, I think one of the things that I wanted to raise was the concept of when we talk about research in itself. And I think that's a discussion that we had at Leisure Studies that, you know, um, about... Um, um, the language right so usually when you say oh no and i was thinking here like you know, one of the problems of tourism is that is research mostly written by white men still right and still the gatekeepers are white men even if that's shifting in recent years right um but but then i stopped and like well i'm talking about research but i'm i'm talking about research written in english mm -hmm. and we still ignore a whole range of knowledge that is not written in English because we are so into research, research, research. When we talk, and actually we're talking about uh, papers published in international journals written in English. Um, and and that's, that has been one of the things that I've been trying to do more recently, which is getting philosophers and authors from the global South who write in languages that I can understand uh, and try to uh, introduce them to to English speakers. Um, so I'm wondering if you, if this is part of of the current issues that we have with whiteness, 
um, and with um, hyper masculinity and and in in tourism academia. I just wonder you if you could reflect a little bit on that. So, yeah, I think that you know these discussions have been going on for for many years, right? So it's a sort of Anglo. It's not just Eurocentric; it's Anglo-centric as well, right? Um, Anglo and Eurocentrism dominates a lot of not just research, but a lot of our social lives, right? So I think there's an arrogance about people who speak English, right? And I'm including myself because obviously I speak English as my native language um, based on my colonial heritage. I inherited English um, as my language. So, you know, I think that there's a certain arrogance um, with people who speak English to feel that they have a monopoly on knowledge yeah, and I think that that is an issue in terms of research. Um, now, certainly engaging people who do not speak English, um, it, it's a problem. I have to be honest, it, it, there is a complexity in it um, because I do remember when um, maybe decades ago, when Nguji Wathiongo, he rejected English in terms of his, I don't know if you've read his stuff on decolonization, and he rejected English and started writing in his own language. Um, in his own um, Jikundu, I think it was. And, but then it had to be translated into English for people to understand it. So this whole notion of having to translate is still problematic. You see what I mean? Because you're not actually reading it in the language, you're translating it into English. So again, there is this dominance of English because you're actually not engaging with the language. So there is no need for people who speak English to try to learn other languages because obviously it's going to be translated. So to me, that again presents, you know, another sort of complexity. So while we're saying, yeah, we're going to introduce, you know, all of these other languages and we need to, to understand knowledge, we're still having to filter it through um, English as a language. And I don't know um, that I particularly have any sort of answer to this um, as to how we sort of overcome this. But I think the fact that we are talking about it and trying to find, I'm sure if we talk about it enough, we will find a way to get around this, right? Um, I mean, I really would love to be able to read fluently um, in, in another language. But, you know, and even with other languages, sorry to go on about this, but the other languages are still sometimes, you know, the usual European languages, Spanish, Portuguese, you know, they're still European language. But what about the languages, the other languages? Yeah. Do you see what I mean? So it, there's still a Eurocentric dominance even in terms of the language issue. Yeah. I think I think it's, it's just the fact that, I think it, it always comes back to that, um, that sentence that we read in thesis or, or or, or papers saying, oh, there is no research published about this topic. It's like, well, the research that you, you read in your own language, but, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that, there, you know, so, and it's, I think there is a little bit of this. And, and I think what I would like just, and I think it's just a call for, for academics from multiple backgrounds is, is to try to bring these other voices. And that means indigenous knowledge. And we've seen a huge mm. growth in, in, in mm. indigenous theory and in tourism and things like that. Um, and, and, but also other, other philosophers and other that maybe have not, been, has not been, have not been translated to English, as you said, that can be problematic, but it's, it's, it's about introducing those authors from the global South to the, the tourism literature because I still think a lot of our tourism literature is based on, on global no North um, philosophy and global North knowledge and, and so on. And I think we need to encourage people from the global South to bring those people and those names. And even, even if they're writing English, right? And I'm, I'm obviously, you know, writing English is something that we want to escape, as you mentioned, but it's just like we desperately need to open our eyes to different type of philosophies and, and knowledge. Um, and I think we're a bit slow on that. But yeah, but thank you so much. No, Adana, it's, it's yeah, I mean, I, I, I do agree with that. I mean, there, there's another, another point as well, because, um, and again, this has been written about, not because it, it depends on, on how you, you sort of see, see yourself as well, because, and, and, and what, what, what your sort of, what environment you are in as well, because not because you are somebody who is not white, it doesn't mean that you're thinking in this way, 
right? So you could say, okay, we're going to bring some more. You know, it's like this diversity discussion. We're going to bring, bring some more Black people into positions of power, right? We're going to bring more women into, into positions of power and, and influence. And then they're not thinking in this way, right? It's just adding, is, is this diversity thing? Let's just have more, right? Without thinking about, okay, are they thinking in any different way? You know, do they bring a different approach, right? Because you have to realize that this is a complex thing. It's not, you know, it's not just about adding people, right? To take the diversity box or to take the, the you know, the research. Okay, we have more scholars from, um, you know, from, from Latin America, from the Caribbean. And so what, what is the thinking? What, what is their thinking? Because if they're just going to duplicate the, the sort of Western ways of thinking, then so, so what? So I think it, it you know, it, it, it's quite a, a complex thing. Um, yeah. Is there, is there a thing, I think there's a question in the chat, um, Brian. Let me have a look. Okay, I'll read it out. Um, thank you, Carlos. Um, in your view, do Latin American women, perhaps not self-defined and perceived as black or as white, question mark, experience intersectionality in a differentiated way? Yeah, so Latin America is an interesting, is interesting, right? Because it's, it's a very sort of mixed racially, mixed ethnic, you know, an ethnic mix. Um, so I think the question of people in Latin America who are white, who consider themselves to be white, I think that's quite a complex thing. Um, if you look at places like Cuba, for example, um, there is a big sort of, there's a lot of, of disadvantage that are faced by black Cubans as opposed to white Cubans, right? Similarly in Brazil, right? In, you know, in, in, in places um, that are predominantly black, there is this kind of hierarchy um, in terms of race, even in Latin America. So I would, I'm not from Latin America myself, and it would be great if somebody from Latin America could speak to this, but just I would say that it would, I think, be different, you know, in terms of the fact that they are from Latin America and they are white, it's going to be different from, say, a Western white person. I would think that that is different, right? But also there are those problematics in Latin America between the different ethnic groups, between black and white populations. So this is why I'm saying it's a complex thing, not because you are from Latin America. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily, you know, somebody who is considered to be a black person because there are those disadvantages that are faced by black Latinos as well as compared to white Latinos. So I don't know if that, that, that answers your question, but I would think that they would experience intersectionality in a, in a differentiated way. Um, you know, there are all these layers, these kind of hierarchies and layers um, that exist. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, does anybody else have a question? Is that hands up, Wenji Kai? No. Perhaps um, not. Any? I think maybe it's an addition from what I was saying that um, they will experience this uh, differently. Yeah. So uh, I, I think this uh, also happens between the same race and uh, black people. There's a uh, uh, like uh, colored skinned people in the Yeah, I didn't hear that. Yeah, I don't know, Brian, if you heard that, but the connection is I couldn't really hear what Ellen thinking. was saying. No, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Ellen. Um, I couldn't, we couldn't hear what you were saying. You, you might just be able to type it perhaps in the chat and we might have a chance to to answer, but your, your connection was very bad. And, and that's another element in all of this, isn't it? There's some um, internet privilege as well these days. Yeah. Um, people who have um, very good connection with the internet are ex extremely privileged in comparison to those who it's only, it's only very poor um, or it's, it's not available at all. Do we have any further questions or um, I'll just, um, see if uh, one appears in the chat at all and 
Um, does anybody else uh, like to ask Donna a question at all? Yeah, I think people are still thinking. <laughs> people are still thinking there was a lot to chew over everything you've said. <laughs> uh, of course, it's, you know, it goes without saying that a lot of this is very difficult for somebody such as myself who um, has everything stacked against him in terms of uh, <laughs> understanding the nature of privilege being, um, you know, um, white, male, grey haired, um, uh, well educated, um, and with an average to good internet connection. Um, as I say that now, it's probably going to go down because it does in this part of the world sometimes. But uh, okay, um, a lot of people are saying thank you on the chat and um, saying very thought-provoking presentation. And I'd like to to second um, that and say thank you very much, Donna, for your your talk today. I'm I'm sorry for those who had a question and it wasn't possible for you to get through. Um, I will um, remind everybody um, that uh, this has been recorded and will be available on YouTube on the Siva Swansea YouTube channel. Um, so it just remains for me to just again to express, I think everybody's thanks to uh, Donna for this um, wonderful lecture that she's given this afternoon and to uh, thank you as the audience for your attending this, um, this one and others in the series that you may have been able to attend. Um, I do hope that it's been um, uh, a useful um, forum of, of, uh, for everybody to be um, joining and thinking about the, um, to re be uh, thinking about uh, uh, the pandemic and uh, how that's affecting tourism and how we can rethink tourism in the pandemic times. And, uh, begin again um, uh, and we, we're all looking forward I'm sure to our uh, tourism starting up proper again um, so uh, thank you very much um, Donna thank you uh, for having thank me. you very much audience and we'll sign off now bye bye, <laughs> bye.